they're going to join us, have joined us. Good afternoon. My name is Josh Ebner. I'm the president of the Society of the Descendants of the Schmankfeldian Exiles. I'm happy to have you here at the Library and Heritage Center. <clears throat> we just got done our annual meeting, which is the best meeting I have of the year because it only lasts 15 minutes. <laughs> so, amen on that. Today we have a great program brought to you by Linda Evans of the Lansdale Historical Society and my daughter, Anna Hebner. They've worked diligently on this project and I think it'll be uh, some really interesting info for you today. So uh, without further ado, Linda and Anna, come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to see so many people here. Can you hear me? Am I close enough to the mic? Okay, good. Um, I was excited to work with Anna also, who's a descendant of David S. Hebner, uh, the original uh, originator of the Hebner Agricultural Works. So are there any Hebners here today? You can raise your hands. I thought there'd be more. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the business end of the Hebner Agricultural Works, and Anna is going to present the personal lives of the three main uh, principals of the Agricultural Works, David S., Isaac D., and William D. Hebner. So we got a lot of our research from the um, Frank Blaze book, And here's, here's my research copy, as you can see, well used, every page almost. I'm like, I have to include this, I have to include this. And these are for sale in the Schwenkfelder gift shop uh, for $15. If you need more information, and there is more information in, in here than I'm able to present in this program, but it's a wonderful book. Um, like I couldn't put it down. <laughs> Also, um, Dick Shear, uh, the editor of the North Penn Reporter and associated with the Lansdale Historical Society, had previously done a program that he allowed me to freely take from and other writings that he did. Um, newspaper, well, this is Frank Blaze's book he did in 1984. He, um, Dick said, Dick Shearer said he was over at the newspaper going through microfilm and looking at hard copies of the newspaper, looking for all this Hebner information. And uh, now we have newspapers.com where you can put in the name Hebner and all the hits from the paper come up. So Frank really put a lot of work into his book. And also I wanna thank the Schwenkfelder Library for um, some things they helped me with. Um, they you know, the caretakers of all things Hebner. And there's a display just behind here of some of the Hebner equipment that you're welcome to look at afterwards. So in 1922, Lansdale was celebrating 50 years and they put out a book they called the Rooster Book. Look like this because it has a rooster on it. I don't know why. Um, but inside it says Lansdale was born August 24th, 1872. That was the date of incorporation. And they list the father's name as North Pennsylvania Railroad and the mother's name as the Hebner Agricultural Machinery Plant. So right here we can see the importance of the Hebners to the town of Lansdale. The railroad um, came through in 1856. Um, Lansdale was known as the old mud hole previous to that. And the only people there were the Jenkins of the Jenkins farm. And so as, uh, as the railroad was being built up to Bethlehem, Doylestown said, hey, we want the railroad to come to Doylestown. So Philip Lansdale Fox, a surveyor, went out looking for a place to put a junction. And he came to the mud hole and all that was there was the Jenkinses. And since there was no real objections, he said, okay, let's put the junction here. And they named the depot after his middle name, Lansdale. So that's how the railroad became the uh, father of Lansdale. 
The coming of the railroad turned the muddy farmland into the bustling town of Lansdale during the second half of the 19th century, but it didn't happen without an assist from a business that provided hundreds of jobs for new residents in the community. Hebner and Sons Agricultural Works was not just any old business. It became the world's largest manufacturer of horse-powered farm equipment. Hebner's reputation spread far and wide and his products were highly sought after by farmers around the world. The father and sons who began the business were David S. Hebner, the father, and his sons Isaac, William, Josiah, and Jacob. David S. Hebner was born in 1810 in Worcester and began his farm implement business in 1840. In 1850, he sold his farm to Samuel Y. Creeble, but reserved 11 acres for himself and turned to the manufacture of farm equipment. He began by making some of the traditional implements of the time, threshers, horse rakes, mowers, and the like. With the help of his brothers-in-law, he bought in a two-horse power. The horse power, essentially horses on a treadmill, supplied the muscle to run a variety of farm machines that were connected to it by a belt and pulley system. The crude horse power had a nickname, the horse killer, and it, it was inclined and it tore up the horse's hooves. Hebner saw the potential in this, in this machine, however. During its formative years, the Hebner Agricultural Works was a one and two man operation. The name of the business went through several changes over the years. So I might be using Hebner and Sons, HAW, Hebner Agricultural Works. They were primarily manufacturing horse powers, mowers and reapers. It was a slow process as building a horsepower from scratch took about six weeks. Early on, David built these machines with only one other man to help. In 1862, two of David's sons, Isaac, who was 21, and Josiah, who was 18, joined the business. They continued the operation until 1869. Josiah preferred staying in Worcester, perfecting the equipment and working at the original agricultural works on Township Line Road near North Trooper Road, across from the Schwenkfelder Meeting House. Another son was Jacob, who helped supply lumber for the business. In 1868, Isaac sold his share of the business and moved into Lansdale. He bought a house from his father-in-law on the corner of East Main and South Broad Street. On the lot, he built a small building, 12 by 26 feet, and opened a machine repair shop. At the time, it was the only house east of the railroad, except for the Jenkins homestead. And even in this map of a couple years later, we can see there wasn't much building on the east side of the uh, railroad. If you remember from the beginning of the program, Lansdale was not incorporated until 1872. So Isaac Hebner laid the foundation of for the agricultural works in the village of Lansdale several years before it became an incorporated town. Soon after, younger brother William became an apprentice to Isaac. The Hebners had enjoyed selling their machines locally as information spread by word of mouth. In this ad from the very first edition of their Lansdale Reporter, we can see all of the items they were selling. They were making and selling mowers, reapers, horse rakes, threshing machines, feed cutters, wild cucumber wood pumps, and washing machines. Early on, they also sold musical instruments. You want to ask me what a wild cucumber wood pump is? <laughs> okay, I looked it up. It's a simple barnyard type pump readily available in the 1870s and 1880s, featuring a wood pipe made out of cucumber wood, and sunk into a well or a cistern. It would filter water and could sustain the strong pool of water through it. The big breakthrough came in 1870 when David and Josiah introduced and patented the celebrated level tread horsepower that became the centerpiece of their company. Unlike the horse killer, 
This invention spared the animals and made the work easier for the farmer. Here's a, the ad shows um, the patent, 1871. Now I know you're probably gonna ask me what made the Hebner machine different and so much better than the horsepower that already existed. So I'm gonna take the description from Frank Blaze's book. He said the floor of the horsepower of which the firm held the patent was alone worth the use of the machine. It was constructed so that the horse stood perfectly level when the horsepower was elevated. The Hebner lever, level tread power was wider than others allowing more space for the horse to work. The lags on which the horse walked were level, allowing the horse to place its feet in a natural position and enabling it to use all of its power in propelling the machine without losing any and keeping a foothold. The level lag also rendered it unnecessary to keep the horse shod. The horsepower also had a governor to regulate the speed of the machine. After the success of their newly patented horse tread, they discontinued making mowers and reapers. David, who was on the board of the Stony Creek Railroad, was unable to convince the engineers to bring the railroad by his shop in Worcester, so he decided to move into Lansdale along with Isaac and William. They built their new factory beside the tracks of the North Pennsylvania Railroad. The three-story, 40 by 60 foot building opened in April of 1872. So this was just before August when the, the year and the time that Lansdale was incorporated. Local competition helped to improve the reputation of the Hebner equipment. They began to win medals and prizes at agricultural fairs locally and in other states. The firm's holdings in Lansdale were expanded by buying an exist, existing foundry on Chestnut Street, where they began making their own castings and manufacturing iron fence for residential use. There's an example of this fencing in the nearby gallery. We often see remnants of it in Lansdale. We try to get our hands on some of it. <laughs> In 1876, the National Centennial Celebration came to Philadelphia. The Hebners shipped one of their celebrated little giant threshers and cleaners and one and two level tread horse powers and several other pieces all painted up and done up in the best style. Hebner and Sons were awarded the first prize, the Centennial Medal. Their horsepower and thresher over all of the entrance from the United States. This was a real breakthrough for the business. The exposure at this exhibit was a major reason for their later success. As a result of this, the Hebners began receiving orders for their horsepowers and threshers from all over the world. Here's just the, showing the early thresher. This is an ad where they're talking about the different medals that they won. Some of their orders were placed at the floor of the Centennial, including an order for five level tread horsepowers for Cape Town, South Africa. This is a medal that the Schwenkfelder Library has from 1899. In 1877, the Hebners purchased from Andrew D. Creeble a farmhouse and four lots for $1,600. This was known as the Old Spring Farm because it contained a valuable water source known as the Never Failing Spring. The Hebners laid pipe, pipe from the spring to the agricultural works as there was no public water works in Lansdale. This is now the headquarters of the Lansdale Historical Society who are caretakers of the Jenkins Homestead. Over the next several years, the orders poured in not only from the US states, but from all over the world, Virginia, Georgia, Tennessee, as well as South America, Bulgaria, Turkey, Africa, and Panama. Thanks to their agent in Maine, Joseph L. True, there was a steady stream of orders from the New England states, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. And here's just a look at the um, 
level tread horsepower, running a thresher. Everybody posing for the camera. Here's more of a close up of the horsepower. And over on this side, we can see, uh, we believe that's William on the top right and Isaac over here, both of them in suits. <clears throat> The demand for the equipment led to some enlarging and improving of, of buildings and work areas. The foundry burned in 1879 and some of the patterns were lost, but not all of them. And this of course led to a new improved foundry. Now you have to use your imagination a little bit for this story, but it's a wonderful example of their marketing and advertising expertise. On May 27, 1880, Lansdale residents witnessed a grand and novel sight when Hebner's and Sons planned a spectacular parade for the delivery of their machinery to local farmers. About 70 farmers who had ordered machines of all kinds came to um, at the works on Broad Street with all their wagons and teams of horses to receive their equipment. At 7 a.m., the farmers began to arrive at the works and the business of loading the wagons commenced. By early noon, some 60 wagons had been loaded and driven in a line on Jenkins Avenue, ready to parade the Hebner machinery through the streets of Lansdale. Then the horses were detached from the wagons and taken away to be fed, while the farmers were quietly parceled out to the three different hotels in towns to be fed, fed an abundant lunch. By 2 p.m., nearly all the teams and the, of horses had been hooked up to their wagons again, and the owners had returned to await the crack of the whip to start the parade. The signal for the parade to move was the starting of the train to Philadelphia, consisting of 19 flat cars filled with Hebner horsepowers and threshers, which formed part of the grand delivery for the day. As the train passed out of sight with its handsomely painted freight, the parade of wagons began headed by the Lansdale Cornet Band. <laughs> Immediately after came the chariot containing Mr. J.L. True, the general agent for the firm, and several invited guests and members of the press. After parading up and down several streets in Lansdale, the line of wagons slowly dissipated to their various homes with their Hebner machines on board. The equipment on the train was headed for various towns in Pennsylvania, as well as New Jersey, Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. Even after all the farmers had and the train had left, the festivities continued with a grand finale on the lawn of Isaac Hebner's house at Maine and Broad. The newspaper article in the local paper goes into even more detail than this, but whoever thought up this public display to promote the importance of the products of the Hebner Agricultural Works could surely get a job on Madison Avenue today. This ad from 1881 details the amazing amount of products coming out of the works. The level tread horsepowers were being used to power a flat boat on the Ohio River, a ferry boat in Nebraska, and to run a printing press in Ohio. The Hebners had also gotten involved with providing boilers for creameries, mills, and other factories. J.L. True, the general agent in Maine, wrote to the firm to announce the sale of 70 machines if he could get them. The works were being taxed to the utmost to fill the orders and the men were working until 10 o'clock at night. In September of 1882, they were at work on their third hundred of machines needed for that year and they were turning out about 15 machines a week. J.L. True had to turn down an order for 40 more machines because the plant couldn't handle it. These were heady days for the agricultural works and an expansion was needed. In October of 1882, the foundation for the new brick building was laid. The craftsmen's work quickly building the new walls around the old building while inside, the work on the Hebner machines continued. The new building was 156 long, feet long, fronting on South Broad Street, 
two large wings were built at the back. This one, you can see one of the wings of the back. When the building was completed, the firm employed no less than 100 men and was capable of turning out over 500 machines a year. Here we can also clearly see the clock tower. The four-sided clock was made by David S. Hebner at the age of 73. It took him 87 days. The pattern for it was made by a skilled pattern maker, Oswin Krauss, another Schwenk builder. Oswin was also responsible for keeping the clock running and on time, which he did by climbing the outside staircase until he became too old to do it. You can see that outside staircase. And I think I already had to do this every three days to keep the clock accurate. And it was a four-sided clock. There was a clock on each side. In 1926, Lansdale Schwenkfelder pastor L.S. Hoffman wrote a tribute to David S. Hebner in a multiverse poem called The Village Clock. A bell cast by the Thomas Duren Bell Foundry in North Wales was also installed. It was, they called it Little Ben. The bell now sits in front of the Lansdale VFW post. And here we see a floor plan of the new enlarged um, Hebner equipment building. To me, it, it kind of seems, it doesn't seem quite right because the finished dock ends up on the third floor. You think you'd want it down on the first floor ready to go, but that's how they had it. And here you can see how a railroad spur comes off to the Hebners for them to load up uh, train cars. This lithograph was created in 1882 to celebrate the opening of the expanded works. And I thank uh, Josh Hebner for bringing his wall hanging. It had an outdoor scene and a view of the interior of a barn. In the harvest field stood the level tread horsepower and the little giant thresher and cleaner. A large number of these lithographs were ordered to be distributed by Hebner's agents. The firm, firm also published a catalog showing a complete line of their wares. I think this was the first catalog they put out in 1882. And this is from the 1885 map that's on display over there, drawing of the agricultural works. You can see the tree tracks there, and this is the back of it, where you can see the two wings. Competitions and fairs also continued with the Hebner equipment continuing to earn prizes and medals and bragging rights. Orders came in from countries near and far, including Africa, Panama, New South Wales, Russia, Mexico, Bulgaria, Nova Scotia, Germany, Australia, Japan, Hong Kong, Tas Tasmania, Argentina, and others. The Lansdale paper from these times have several mentions of Hebner in every edition, either an ad or general news of the plant and the Hebner principals and or employees. Now this map, also, that one on display just uh, is an interesting to show the Hebner Holdings in 1885. Down here at the bottom, we can see the foundry, the rebuilt foundry. It had burned down. They rebuilt it. And then in a little bit more detail, of course, the main agricultural works right there. Let me see if this helps. Over here is the house that Isaac had bought originally. And in this corner is a house that uh, David, the father, built. And over here is William's house. And behind it, um, there are two warehouses that the Hebners built. So they own quite a bit right in this area right here. Now we're about to see that Isaac is about to get rid of this house and start something else. So in 1881, uh, William, as part of an exchange, obtained the house here on the corner of South Broad and Jenkins Avenue. 
and directly behind his new home, uh, the Hebr Hebner Agricultural Works built stables and two warehouses. I'd also like to bring up that the Hebners had many trusted uh, in department heads and supervisors to run their operation. In later years, it was says that the works could run itself whether Bill Hebner was in town or not. Joseph Moyer was their trusted bookkeeper, J.L. True, their salesman on the road, and Nathaniel Metz was the plant super, superintendent and inventor. He began working for them in 1877. Among his inventions and improvements were a steam heating system, which he worked on with William, and which Hebner's began manufacturing for homes, schoolhouses, and factories. He also invented a shredding attachment for Hebner's feed cutters and improvements on their threshing machine. Many of their workers became skilled at what they did. H.D. Faisal painted the ornamentation on the sides of the Hebner machines. I mean, why would you even need ornamentation? But they, they took in that detail. A reporter wrote, while looking around the paint room, we saw Mr. H.D. Faisal at work painting ornaments on the machines. He did so so rapidly and each ornament was a facsimile of the other. Faisal had been painting the machines for seven years at this point, and he estimated he had painted 7,000 machines. Each horsepower had four ornaments, each thresher had two, and the cleaners and fodder cutters had two each. All of this was done freehand without stencils. The reporter went on to say, we said nothing about the stripes of which there must have been miles and miles. Hebner's mag manufactured a plow improvement designed and patented by Charles Sorber Jenkins. Jenkins was also the inventor of the map roller, which was manufactured by the Hebner Agricultural Works. The map rollers were sold to schools, government agencies, and offices. I think we remember the, our teachers pulling down these maps, different maps, and it was invented by a Jenkins and manufactured by the Hebners. This is a picture of uh, some of the working men, over 50 of the working men of Hebners. And right here sitting in front is David, the father, and Next to him is Isaac, and this is William. This is a William threshing grain. They often went out in the field either for trials or just to demonstrate their equipment. And you can't see the, the horsepower, but here's the pulley that's connected to the horsepower off screen. Frank Blaze. Quote, why had the business of Hebner and Sons grown so large? In the first place, it had excellent machines. In the second place, the, third, the firm made large investments in advertising. The Sons in particular kept on investing in this way and reaped the benefit. The Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876 drew the attention of the world to their machines. In competition with many other machines, the Hebners were awarded medals as a token of the great superiority of their machines over all others. And here's William with a, a horsepower working as saw. The Hebners went on expanding their product line, exhibiting with other firms, displaying their products and taking more orders. The US government ordered 20 level tread horsepowers and 24 inch circular sawing machines. Josiah continued to perfect the machinery for the firm. His low down grain binder, which he had been working on for six years, did so well in its trial operation that the Hebners made patterns and started manufacturing the machine immediately. The machine ushered in another round of orders for the works. Uh, this map from 1886, we see here that Isaac has not built his new uh, house yet, but he's about to, 1887. And here's the main agricultural works, David's house, William's property here, and the warehouses, and the foundry down here at the bottom. Plus, they had other, other uh, properties here and there. 
And Isaac in 1887 decided to tear down the house in which he lived at the corner of Main and Broad. A new house designed by architect Milton Bean was completed in 1888. However, in 1892, Isaac sold this house to A.G. Freed, who expanded it and turned it into a hotel, the Tremont House. We don't know why Isaac decided to sell out at this time. This meant that the Hebners no longer controlled the whole of the triangular property that contained the, the agricultural work. So at one time they, you know, for a long time they had this property here, but now Isaac has sold his part of the property. Not sure where he went. I think he may have moved in with his father for a while. Also, in 1887, David and Isaac stepped back from the management of the firm and turned it over to William. David was 77 years old. This is 1887. Isaac's health had been impaired by years of labor and business responsibilities. Isaac could not, however, completely disengage himself from the agricultural works, and he continued to sell new and used machinery not manufactured by the Hebners until 1890. William, who was 39 years old in 1887, had spent enough time with the business to know the ins and outs. Despite other interests, he ran the firm until turning it over to his children in the 1920s. In 1888, the Hedners held their first annual picnic for their employees. It took 37 strong horses and 16 wagons to transport the employees and their families to the fairly new Weldon House on the banks of the Perkiam and Creek in Schwanksville. Was at that time it was called Delphi, that little area. I don't want to tell you what I went through trying to find an old picture of the Weldon House. <laughs> the procession was like a parade with the Lansdale Cornet Band leading, William and his family in an easy riding carriage, and all the wagons festooned with flags and banners. The journey was not without some delays. Uh, one of the wagons had an overhead banner that got caught in some branches, and then another wagon broke down, and at a toll house there was a near pileup of wagons. But despite starting out at 7 a.m., the group didn't arrive there until after 11 a.m. But in the end, a good time was had by all. In 1888, it was necessary to have the employees working into the night in order to keep up. The works used incandescent electric lights that had recently been installed. Almost a carload a week was shipped to some point around the world. They also attended fairs in several towns in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. They installed the steam heating system designed by William Hebner and Nathaniel Metz in the government buildings in Harrisburg, including the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the Executive Mansion. The total cost was $3,500. In 1892, they started advertising in the Montgomery Ward catalog out of Chicago, Illinois. The one horsepower listed for $72, a two horsepower was $91, and the thresher and cleaner $225. The Hebners were always looking for new uses for their machines and, all, and ways to adapt them for specialized tasks. William adapted their little giant thresher for use on peanut plantations. He took it to Virginia to try it out and it was a great success with many orders. It would just be repetition to go on and on about competitions in local and state fairs and new markets and orders from all over the world expansion of buildings, employees working overtime, improvements of all kinds on the machines, as well as new inventions and advertising genius. The Heapners did it all with the help of their longtime loyal and skilled workers. And here's a picture of them with William in the front in their parade uniforms. And somewhere here, they have one of those caps. <laughs> In 
1897, Josiah perfected a rotary motor after several years of work. It was designed to work on steam, but William wanted to also try it out with compressed air. The first trial of the new motor was on the farm of brother Jacob D. Hebner, where it's worked successfully with a fodder cutter. Uh, this is a, a newer um, aerial of the Jenkins uh, Avenue area, but um, they also obtained this building here. Right here, you can see William's house. Back here is where the Stanbridge apartments are now. And this is one of the warehouses that's still standing, but they obtained this whole property here as well in 1899. Um, and we'll see that part of the this original building still stands. In 1899, the foundry manufactured iron gates at the entrance to the Lansdale Cemetery to replace the decaying wooden gates. But as you can see, they were taken off at some time, not there anymore. In May of 1900, David S. Hebner, probably the oldest resident of Lansdale, died just short of his 90th birthday. And Anna will let us know more about his life and death. When the plant shut down in, in 1902 for some repairs, the workers took advantage of the time to form a union. They presented their demands to William, but he would not meet them. The workers struck for two months. During that time, the firm hired non-union -work workers. When an agreement was finally reached, some of the original workers had already found other jobs and did not return. Even through these difficult times, the plant was able to fill an order for 25 complete threshing outfits to be shipped to Siberia. The death of the founder and the advent of a new kind of mechanical power was a new opportunity for the Hebner Agricultural Works. In 1906, Nathaniel Metz applied for a patent for an internal combustion engine, which wasn't granted until 1910. He assigned one half of the rights, title, and interest to William. From the time the Hebners started their agricultural firm, there had never been a time when the supply exceeded the demand. It was always the policy of the firm to have its output in every department below rather than above what was required. This enabled the firm to select its customers and accept only those of known probity, thus making the matters of collection an easy task. The firm's business-like methods and known adherence to fair dealing combined with the excellence of its machines, enabled it to retain old customers and make new friends at home and abroad. Yet another new venture captured William's imagination at this time. He purchased an Oldsmobile with which he was well pleased. So pleased that he decided to secure the local sales agency for the cars. This was the beginning of Hebner Motors. Additionally, they offered Ford automobiles for sale. In 1909, Josiah, Josiah, brother of William, died at 65 years of age. Since 1862, when he joined with his father David and brother Isaac to form the Heber, Hebner Agricultural Works in Worcester, Josiah had continued to invent and perfect the farm machinery which had made the work so successful. He stayed in Worcester at the original site of the Hebner machine shop and even turned over his patents to his father and brothers. Although he was very active in the business, he was of a retiring disposition and never sought or held any um, offices. For many years, he was the chorister of the Worcester Schwenkfelder Church and he is interred in the cemetery there, very close to the workshop where he spent his life inventing and improving upon the best possible farm machinery. Perhaps the biggest change in the way Hebners did business came in 1910 when the company signed a three-year agreement with International Harvester to exclusively sell grain threshers manufactured by Hebners. Most of them had gasoline-powered engines added to them when they arrived at IH and sold under the Sterling name 
exclusive to IH. They were actually the popular Pennsylvania threshers, which had been sold by the Hebners for 69 years. The name Hebner would not appear on the, on the threshers. The new casting read, made for International Harvester Company of America, Chicago, Illinois, USA. At the time, the market for the Hebner threshers had locally had become saturated so the agreement with IH opened up more markets for the Hebner products. Anyone ordering a machine directly from the Lansdale plant would be thanked for their business and redirected to International Harvester. In 1913, after the uh, three-year agreement ran out, International Harvester continued to sell the Hebner equipment, but Hebner's was again free to sell their equipment under their own name. By the 1920s, Hebner's products were excess baggage for International Harvester, and they were liquidated from the warehouses. It marked the end of Hebner and Sons as a manufacturer of farm machinery. In August, on August 14, 1925, William D. Hebner, now the sole owner of Hebner and Sons, retired. He presented to his children all personal property <coughs> and all of the real estate involved, which include the main factory, the foundry, the machine shop, the warehouses, and other buildings. His hope was that they would continue to operate the company, but that was not to be. On January 4th, 1926, the doors closed forever. Only 35 employees remained at the time. The main factory, a landmark since 1872, lasted until 1944 when it was dismantled and disappeared forever. I'll turn the program over to Anna Hebner now, and she will discuss the personal lives of the Hebners and what they did for the town of Lansdale. And at the end, I have just a few closing remarks. Hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, I'm Anna. I'm a Hebner. Um, and so I thought I'd just start my presentation with this picture uh, just to tell you like which Hebners I actually came from. So this guy right here, that's David Hebner, who Linda talked about a little bit. Um, the guy above him is Jacob Hebner. The guy next to him is David K. Hebner. And then the little guy is Amos. And Amos is my great, great uncle. Great uncle. There you go. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that it's important to study my own heritage. I'm, I'm kind of at an age where it's becoming more important to me to know where I came from and who I am and who my ancestors are. Um, so I'm here to tell you all about that, too. So <clears throat> first, I'll start with David S. Hebner. So David S. Hebner, born June 25th, 1810, is the first and oldest person in the study. He grew up on a farm in Worcester Township with his parents, Bal sorry, this guy's hard to pronounce, Balthazar Hebner and Susanna Schultz, making him a third generation Schwenkfelder immigrant. His father, Balthazar, is credited with actually keeping record of all of the Schwenkfelders, um, which is how I know I'm related to all these people. Um, so David grew up on his family's farm in Worcester uh, and I just put a picture of his face on a farm because he worked on a farm. Um, and while he was at this farm, he began designing, oh, here's his house also on this farm. And here's the location of where he would have lived. Wiener. Oh, sorry, this one's like kind of hard to spot. All right, let's see. This, there it is right here. It says D.S. Hebner, he lives right here. Um, and so he started designing clocks at a pretty young age. He made, made a name for himself in designing those clocks, and eventually he would design the clock in the Hebner and Sons Clock Tower. Um, he kept working on the farm until age 30, and then he began producing his own farm equipment, um, and he is most famously known for improving the level tread horsepower. <clears throat> and it took him, with assistance, six weeks to build, just the first one. Um, and it eventually sold worldwide, so that's pretty impressive. Um, he partnered with his sons, Isaac and Josiah, to begin producing farm equipment more efficiently. 
Many of the designs for the farm equipment produced during this time can be attributed to Josiah Hebner. Uh, later, around 1870, he dissolved his partnership and moved to Lansdale. Oh, this is another like location of where he partnered with his sons. So there's the agricultural work. Sorry, my hand's shaking. So that's a, that makes me shaking. Um, so later in 1870, he dissolved his partnership and moved to Lansdale near his sons again, Isaac, and then also William, to partner with them in their agricultural works known as Hebner, Hebner and Sons. David quickly created a name for himself in Lansdale by signing the charter, which made Lansdale into a borough, and also by assuming the title of first Lansdale Burgess, though this may not be true. So here's the charter that made Lansdale to a borough. So here's William D. Hebner right here. Um, there's Isaac Hebner, and there's David S. Hebner. Okay. Um, 20 years later, in 1891, David was elected to be Lansdale postmaster by President Harrison himself. At this point, he was 81, but clearly he was not ready to slow down yet. It took him six whole years to retire after this in 1897. But before I finish the story of David Hebner, I'd like to share some of his personal life with you. In his lifetime, he had two wives, Anna Durstein, who was also known as Anna Hebner, which is my name, which is pretty cool, um, and with whom he had eight children, and Regina Y. Schultz, with whom he only had one child. This is his home in Lansdale. It's called the Eitherton. Um, it's because it was kind of like in between two different towns. So it's like kind of like either town, but it's either ten. Um, and here's like a colored in picture of it, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, he was uh, a very personable man. And while he produced his farm equipment, he had the support of friends and neighbors along the way. He was involved in his church, Worcester Schwenkfelder Church, uh, and was and not only was he involved, but he adhered to the rule of keeping the Sabbath holy. While he lived in Lansdale, he was known to have taken away the nuisance of Sunday baseball playing. Additionally, he was a very gifted chess player, defeating the Pennsylvania champion in two games out of five. He was also known for being, oh, I thought this picture was really cool because like him just sitting on his porch. Um, also, you can see that he's missing a finger. Um, so I don't know the story behind that. Maybe I could have done more research, but yeah, he's missing a finger. It probably happened in the agricultural work somewhere. Yeah. Um, so he was known for being a family man. Uh, and the newspaper says about him, he now enjoys life surrounded by his children and grandchildren in his own way, resting and reading in the armchair on his own veranda, a favorite spot for taking his daily siesta and entertaining relatives and friends who always find beneath his roof a most hospitable welcome waiting them. Um, this was stated by the Lansdale Republican for his 87th birthday. Uh, overall, David S. Hebner was an accomplished man who never let his life go to waste. He strove for excellence in everything that he did, and it certainly paid off. He died happily May 14, 1900, and is buried in Worcester Schwenkfelder Cemetery. The Lansdale Republican puts it best in saying that David S. Hebner was Lansdale's most distinguished and venerable citizen. Um, and this just shows um, what happened to... David S. Hebner's goods after he died. They're all sold for like pretty cheap price. And the most significant part about this is that George Anders purchased the original manuscripts of, I think the, the records, the historical records um, for only $4.50. So thank goodness for George Anders because we wouldn't have those records without him. All right, next I'll be talking about Isaac D. Hebner. And similarly to his father, he achieved many feats throughout his life that gave him the title one of the most respected and loved citizens of Lansdale. He was born January 18th, 1841, making him one of the oldest siblings of the eight children of David and Anna. At age 21, he joined the Hebner and Sons firm in Worcester and picked up his gifts in, me in mechanics there. Um, so here's David's machine shop that he built. And here is Isaac's home. And eventually like the big agricultural works would end up here. So he was very close. Um, and then here's a closer up map. So there's the agricultural works. There's Isaac's house. Mm -hmm. um, so with his new skills in hand, his mechanical skills, he went to Lansdale to start his own repair shop at the corner of Maine and Broad. He was the first brother in Lansdale and having, and having this position, he ended up laying the foundation and buying the land for the agricultural works. The total income for the first year is minimal, but that did not prove to be true the next couple of years. By 1874, he helped in designing new advancements so that the production of goods 
would be higher, which was very necessary as Hebner & Sons was now shipping worldwide. Isaac was also heavily involved in the Lansdale Methodist Church, where he was the organist and the Sunday school superintendent, which I did not know that was a thing, but apparently it was. Um, his love for helping run education carried over into the public schools, and in 1886, he was voted in as the chairman of the board to the Lansdale School District and ended up serving that position for 40 years. After he received this position, he stepped down from the partnership in the agricultural works, but still helped when help was needed. Also at the time, he started the Lansdale Water Company. Don't know why, but. Um, in 1888, he built his most famous home, um, later known as the Hotel Tremont, with the assistance of architect Milton Bean. It was his home for two years when he sold it to A.G. Freed for $17,000. While Hebner lived in the building, it only consisted of one turret. But once the building was bought, an extension with two other turrets was added, giving it, giving it the name Tremont. But Isaac's life was not as impersonal as I've just made it seem. He had one wife, Catherine, with whom he had four children. He was a very skilled musician, being the organist of Lansdale Methodist Church, and this ma and which makes this very clear. His involvement in the school board revealed his love of education and growth of children. He was very highly revered and respected. Isaac D. Hedner's life is certainly not one to overlook, and his compassion and ambition were rewarded with success and reverence. Um, so here's a picture of his wife's grave. So her name was Catherine. Um, and then here's a picture of his grave. Um, and they're both they're both buried in Lansdale Cemetery. So and finally, I will talk about William Hebner. So William Hebner, uh, given the title the pioneer of Lansdale, was quite was quite popular and for good reason. He was born September 27th, 1848, to David S. and Anna Hebner. By age 14, he became an apprentice under his brother Isaac in the agricultural works, leaving behind his schoolboy days. And though this was uncommon for the time, as many students finished school around age 18, William found quick success. Ten years after starting his apprenticeship, he moved to Lansdale and began Hebner and Brothers with Isaac. When David moved to Lansdale in 1872, he joined his, his sons in the endeavor, making it Hebner and Sons. The business was successful for quite some time with the three owners. But in 1887, David S. and Isaac D. left the partnership, leaving William as a sole owner of the agricultural works. During the time that he was in partnership and then owned the business himself, he was involved in Lansdale in many other ways. Um, there's a really long listing of all the things he was involved in, so just bear with me. Um, he was a spokesman of the Lansdale Water Company from 1885 to 1930. He, serves, he served as councilman in Burgess, served two terms in the assembly, and was elected to the state legislature. He was the treasurer for Jessup and Moore Paper Company, the Southern Transportation Company, and the Henrico Lumber Company for a time. He was one of the largest stockholders, vice president, and director of the First National Bank of Lansdale. He was the chairman of the draft board of World War I in Lansdale. He was the director of the People's National Bank of Norristown, and in 1907, he founded and managed the first Lansdale baseball, baseball league and founded the first Lansdale Fire Company began his own ownership of the Electric Light Company and started the first Lansdale Shoe Company, the Babcock Shoe Company. Then he also founded his own newspaper company, um, which was called the Lansdale Republican in 1896. <sighs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm tired. Um, <laughs> um, he also proved his immense love of music by founding the Lansdale Music Hall. Um, and he naturally became the director of the orchestra that performed there. I thought this was a really neat picture. Um, so there's William right there. And Isaac is kind of in the corner, he got cut off, but like there's like a bass right here. I think he played the bass probably, so that's him. Um, and this was in the music hall. There's the orchestra that William directed and there's some people. I just think it's interesting to see like, you know, people from a long time ago doing things that we still do today, putting on plays. Um, also, he was heavily involved in the Lansdale Methodist Church, where Isaac was also involved, and he was choir master for almost 60 years. He was also involved in building the second and current Methodist Church on Broad Street, um, which is, I don't think I have, oh no, I do have a picture. Um, and this church was kind of based off of a church that he attended in Florida, because he lived in Florida, um, like, during the off-season. <clears throat> 
Um, his greatest achievement, though, I think deserves the most attention. And that was his involvement in preserving Valley Forge National Park. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> he So in uh, 1887, he was appointed to give Washington's farewell address for Washington's birthday. Um, but instead, he presented a bill to the people there and they voted on it and it was voted to preserve Valley Forge National Park. So if you've ever been there, you have William D. Hebner to thank um, for it still being there. So. Um, he also made time for a personal life somehow. I don't know how, but um, so this is his first wife who he was married to for 31 years and he had four children with her, Emma, and she died in 1881. So he remarried to Elizabeth Shearer. And Elizabeth Shearer, I think, is very interesting because she was involved in the WCTU, which is also known as the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And so these women advocated for prohibition of alcohol in America. So, you know, a little tidbit about her. Um, and he also had four homes. This is his home in Lansdale. This is his home in Oak Park, um, his home in Florida. And... Oh, and all of his homes showcased his green thumb. He also had oh a home in Finland, Pennsylvania, but I don't have a picture of that one, so sorry. Um, <laughs> and he's also known for, oh, his garden was called the most beautiful in its vicinity. Um, and he also had a like a deep love for baseball and other sports, and he was absent at very few of these games. Um, <laughs> His life was a life filled with ambition and success and is certainly one to be remembered. He died February 23rd, 1933, and for his funeral, the church was packed with many of those who admired him. He's buried in the mausoleum in the Lansdale Cemetery. Um, so just to finish off, I have a couple words. So there are lessons to be learned from all of these men. First, as a result of hard work, success comes. Clearly, all three Hebners experienced hardship, but they kept going. They strove for excellence in all aspects of life, um, whether at the work, um, whether at the workplace, at the church, or in the community. They wouldn't be called revered, respected, and loved citizens in the papers if this was not true. A second lesson to be learned is that even obscure history matters. You may hear others talking about the Great Pyramids of Giza or the Revolutionary War, which are both very important. But had this not had this little sliver of history not happened. Um, life would not be the same as it is today for us. Also, simply for interest purposes, this is a great thing to know for extended knowledge. And for me, digging into my ancestry was deeply educational. I hope that you all take something away from this today, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Anna. That was really interesting to hear about the personal lives of the Hebner men. Too bad we don't have Hebner women to, uh, you know, talk more about, but that's the way it was back then. So here's the sad part. What is left of the Hebners in Lansdale? Well, here's a warehouse. Here you can see William's house still standing. This is Jenkins Avenue. This is a warehouse, which my colleague Pat and I just realized earlier this year that it was a Hebner warehouse. So that's still standing. We went inside, it's being used as a business. And we went up to the third floor, which uh, what the, you know, there's nothing left, but um, it's interesting that it's still there. Here's the front view of it. Okay, so take a look up here, that rectangle. You need a little participation. <laughs> Just kind of gaze at it, relax, believe. <laughs> Do you see anything there? No, really. Do you see an S over here? I'm not trying to put this in your head. <laughs> in the right lighting, it, it says Hebner and Sons. I think you can, I, mostly I can see the S-O-N-S -S over there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, so yeah, if you want to go there and stare at it, you'll probably see it. And of course, we still have uh, William's house on the corner of South Broad and Jenkins. This is a picture I took a couple days ago. 
This is a building right along the railroad track um, that uh, William built next to a larger building to house his newspaper. And this is the larger building that was next to it. Now, here's the remnants of what's left. This building had a fire in 1950. The upper level was used by the Corn Cob Pipe Club, but I'm not blaming them. But there was a fire in 1950, and this is what's left, but it's still there in Lansdale next to the Williams house. And of course, we still have the Methodist church that William was uh, instrumental in helping to build. And we still have the music hall building. Okay, now don't get offended here. David, Isaac, and William, will the real Schwenkfelder please stand up? The, the answer is yes, they're all real Schwenkfelders. But as we know, Isaac and William were quite involved in the Methodist Church. But here we see in 1888, when the Methodist Church had been established for 17 or 18 years, they attended the Schwenkfelder Thanksgiving Day with uh, their father, David. Isaac and William and families. So I, you know, I think there's still Schwenkfelders at heart, but there was no Schwenkfelder presence in Lansdale until 1918. So in 1892, David S. was, Hebner was really pushing to get uh, some, some Schwenkfelder presence in Lansdale. And he got together with a, a couple of people and a committee was formed to look around for a piece of ground to start a Schwenkfelder church. That was 1892, but nothing came of it. But um, we do know that um, Reverend L.S. Hoffman was really the impetus behind getting a Schwenkfelder church in Lansdale in 1918. This is a story from the paper uh, that mentions how David tried to get a a Schwenkfelder presence there 20 years previously, but that his son William was attending this 1918 dedication. And William was so moved that he stood up and pledged $100 towards the pews, which hadn't quite been paid for yet, uh, in memory of his father. So like I said, there's still Schwenkfelders at heart. The Hebners left their legacy of innovation business acumen, integrity, and forward thinking. Their mark is seen in the history of the financial, economic, political, educational, religious, and cultural formation of the borough of Lansdale. The 55 years that they were in business caused the phenomenal growth and development of the town, including infrastructure like electric and water. Even though their name is no longer present and there are only a few buildings left, it's hard to imagine what Lansdale would be today without the Heveners. Thank you. Thank you.